Welcome to the show. It's going to be fantastic. Stay tuned for the Chacha Chasse's, how to get not dizzy on spins, and of course, rumba, how to count it. I found a great tool that's gonna really help you understand the breakup of music. I've managed to take a song and break it into the individual uh, pieces of instrument, melody, drum and bass, so you can hear the structure and the layer of the rumba, which will give you an edge in learning how to count it. Because I had this question yesterday in the class and someone actually wrote it to me about, um, about counting the rumba. It's a very difficult dance in the beginning and some for 99% of people, it's a very uh, hard one to hear because you're listening to the wrong thing. So I've got a wonderful tutorial um, to rock out with you. So here we go, let's get to it. The first question comes from Diane. She's asking me about the, uh, the cha-cha chasse. She's not feeling it. I understand that. Is anyone else having troubles with their chasse in the cha-cha? Now I think somewhere else on, uh, I did a tutorial a while ago on um, uh, jive chasse's. I haven't done one for cha-cha yet, but she's saying, Diane Medley, by the way, thank you for being a top fan. She says, I'm not feeling the cha-cha at the moment. Something to do with the chasse action, but struggling to work out what. I also need to move back into my Latin heels. Will that help the hip action and, the sh and shortening my steps? Um, well, it's a good question. Uh, first of all, the easiest thing to understand is that the size of your steps is not related to your shoes to begin with, but keep, the, keep your steps less than shoulder width in terms of size. Secondly, the reason that we have heels, and if you can see here, look at this. Well, there's a heel for you. Um, the, the men wear Latin heels, Cuban heels, one inch heels, so our weight can remain forward easier, so we can create a better rhythm and hip action throughout the Latin dances. Ladies, it's the same for you. You might wear two, two and a half, three inch heels. Three inches is gonna really push the balance forward, so two to two and a half is good, but definitely dance in heels, no doubt about it, because if you dance in flats, your weight will go back into your heels, literally into your heels, and you'll be back weighted when you go to dance, thus losing control. So that's the first instant thing about balance. The second thing is with the chasse in cha-cha-cha. Um, it is known as the dance, the straight-legged dance, but the moving leg is actually bent. So if I just move my chair out to the side, okay. When I take my side step, first of all, your footwork has to be correct. It needs to be the inside edge of the ball, and the knee needs to be slightly flexed, veering inwards. That's important for the chasse. Once the weight transfers, there's a natural hip action. It's called a lateral uh, rope action. It's not a very strong rotation. Your right foot will then close toward or completely closed with a flexed knee. You'll change weight for lowering the heel. So ball heel will be the footwork. The hip will slightly rotate back. And then again, you'll take your side step again. Notice my foot, inside edge of ball, knee veering inwards. My weight will then complete the step. That's the chasse action done correctly to the left. You also reverse it to the right. Inside edge of ball, heel, knee veering inward, uh, kneel. He, knee veering inwards, heel goes down, leg straightens, weight transfers. I close my left foot to my right foot, put the heel down, transfer the weight, foot moves out to the side, and I complete the action. Now here's the thing, notice my leg precedes the body movement. This is a principle of good dancing. We want the foot to catch the body weight. So if I'm doing a chasse to the side, cha, cha, cha can be my rhythmic action, right? If I go the other way, cha, cha, cha is my rhythmic action. Notice body weight is forward because not only of the heels, but my upper body being over the balls of the feet. Now, you will have to practice this because at speed, the faster the tempo, the less you can accentuate that technique. All you have to do is watch professionals on YouTube and you'll notice the chasse rhythm is massively developed in the hips and the upper body, and the feet aren't exactly like spot on. That's what we're aiming for. We're all pursuing perfection, right? But you might notice some, their feet barely touch the floor, but they've got the rhythm action. What we want to do is make sure we get that inside edge and we create that beautiful chasse rhythm um, to coordinate and then practice, practice, practice. It's anything you first do, is basically going to suck and feel very uncomfortable until you master it, okay? So uh, Gaynor Fairweather and Donnie Burns are legends in dancing. If you don't know who they are, they were like 11 times world champion, undefeated in the 90s, and then Brian Watson uh, kept, took the crown after they, I think, retired. Something like that. But the point is, is that they did one hour of rumble walks every day. Okay, one hour of rumble walks. I remember him saying in a lecture that you need to walk to the moon and back. I heard that and went, I think I've gone to Sydney and back. That's like 300 kilometers from here. Uh, and so now I think I'm halfway to the moon. So, was, you know, you've got to do it every single day. You have to practice the thing you're not good at because in dancing our strengths, our weaknesses need to become our strengths. Okay, the next question uh, comes from M Fit Girl. How not to get dizzy on spins? I'm gonna need coffee for this one. All right, there's a lot in this, so I'm gonna run a tutorial on spins versus turns 
and basically how not to die on them. But let's understand one quick thing. The reason you're getting dizzy, you're not spotting. That's number one. But number two, your brain has to adjust to the new force that's being generated when you spin. Okay, so the brain is inside, it's a squishy little sponge inside a very hard uh, skull. And so it will get moved around when you go to high speed and accelerate. It's like if you sit in one of those centrifugal force thingies that spin around at high speed and teach fighter pilots about G-force, you have to get used to that. So spinning is something you get used to by employing correct technique uh, in the feet, correct technique in terms of uh, mechanics, so what the body's doing during the spin, which I'm gonna talk about now, and then lastly, practicing it enough so your brain gets used to it because balance is affected by your eyesight and your inner ear or your middle ear. So those two things play a part. That's why if you don't spot, you're gonna look down, and if you look down, your technique crumbles and you fall onto the ground or you fall apart. You can't spin properly. Okay, with that real brief overview, let me talk about actual spinning. Your body has uh, three axes of movement. So an axis is essentially, if I stand facing you right now, and you cut my body down the middle, the second axis, if I stand side on here, if I cut my body in half, that's called the frontal plane of movement, right? The third axis is horizontal here. That's my sway plane, okay? All three planes have a center in the middle, okay? That center is what in ballroom dancing, Latin dancing, and any dancing, you are always hold, told to hold your posture up, okay? You're told to hold your posture up because those planes of movement, if in any area you have a weakness in posture or a, um, a misalignment of posture, when you add movement and acceleration to that, it's gonna throw you off balance, okay? So if my center is here, and I take a step to make it very simple, and then my weight is pulled that way because of bad alignment or bad technique, you're gonna fall off balance. So then that's just walking. So no wonder spins are so hard because we have to make sure that we have the perfect alignment within each of these areas. And you have to see yourself as a 3D person, not, not flat 2D. On camera, I'm 2D. But 3D means that I've got this plane, this plane, and that plane. So there's actually a big quadrant here of space. There's one here, and there's one here, and one behind me, right? And there's these massive areas. Now, what I do with my posture, this is how you spin and you, you practice. First of all, differentiate between turns and spin. So if we look at a turning three step in, uh, let's just say Samba, for example. First thing to understand is the footwork. So you're going forward on the ball, right? You're turning on the ball and you're changing weight into the left heel. You keep the turn going, then you step to the side on the ball and the heel will lower. That's how you do a turning three step. That is not a spin. But what we do with our posture to practice getting up to spins and double spins and so on is that we practice the footwork but our alignment too. So we understand that when I'm stepping, my foot must point the direction I'm going, not turn in. That's the first thing. Second thing is that my head is spotting where I'm going. So I've turned my head to face where I'm going. And now I'm going to let my shoulders generate the energy to turn. Okay, so my foot's prepared it, my head is spotting, and then my body is going to allow that energy to create the, t the turn for me. When that happens, I've got to make sure my foot completely closes and changes weight. And then I let that energy continue by spotting. Notice my head comes around first. So the way you think about turning and spinning is that we've got the foot, we've got the alignment of the body, we've got the head spotting, and we do it like this. I like to say that the head is the first to go, sorry, the head is the last to go, because I'll spot, and it is the first to arrive. And then with the combination of good footwork and of course good postural principles, you'll have the ability to control the ending. Now if we're looking at double spins, what we wanna now think about is a little, something a little different. So if we're spinning, let's say that you're turning, you are turning around what we call a fixed point of movement. So I'm just gonna say, if I'm fastly moving around the floor and then all of a sudden I plant my foot there, this is now my vertical axis. The ball of my foot right up to the ceiling is where my vertical axis of movement must spin through. So I now need to take my energy around the base of that foot, not over there to the wall. That's why people fall off balance and spins a lot of the time, because the energy should be going from the ball of the foot and spiraling upwards. So if you're spinning, you go up and around, right? That's the feeling. And so if we do it again, and I wanna go that way, I would go up and around, and then I would come out. And that way I'm in control. I'm not throwing my body off and over the foot. 
So there's spotting, there's placing the foot, and wherever that foot goes, the dead center of that is where your vertical axis must spin up and through. Once you've spun to the direction you need to go, your head must be the first thing to arrive so you can then come out of it, okay? And then you, again, you practice that. So you're aiming to do your spins, you're getting your spot on, boom, 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 and off you go, and you come out. And remembering that you're not trying to take your body, a massive energy, that way, even though it looks like I'm going that way, you're actually wanting to take it up and around. That way you can come out. And so, like anything, then practice it, because you'll generate, when you're spinning, far more force than do you do when you do turns. So doing two spins is going to be harder than doing one. All right, third question. This is the really cool one on rumba counts. Um, and I'm going to need to use my phone during this as well to make sure the sound is appropriate. Please note there will be a delay in the uh, feed from this because, uh, well, I notice that sometimes the music might appear a bit off time. So if I sound like I'm counting out of rhythm, I apologize. It might be a, like a millisecond difference in the feed between here and the, in, the YouTube, right? So here we go. This is the song I want us to listen to. I'm going to put it on now for all of us to hear. Hopefully I can hear it too. So have a listen to this just for a second. So, that's the rumba, isn't it? You hear it. Okay, so when we listen to that song, can you hear the right accents? So, you might think, Vaughn, what the hell is an accent? Like, do you mean like this accent? Or like this accent? Like that accent? No, we're talking about an accent, which is a strong beat of music. By the way, I'm not very good at accents, in case you couldn't tell. And so, in rumba, let's understand the very basic ba basis of music really quickly. 4-4 four, four timing, four beats, two a bar. We generally need two bars to complete a basic movement, for example. Okay, so what would the timing of rumba be? How would we count it? Two, three, four, one. The reason we say two is because your figures in rumba commence on beat two. We hear, though, a, per a strong accent on count one. So one, so it's like boom. Then there's a percussive accent on four. So we go boom, 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 boom. Right, that's the basic structure of rumba. Now, unfortunately, it's really hard with modern music to hear that, and not talking about pop music. When we look at strict tempo, which means equal beats, that's our style of dancing. When you hear modern music, like DJ Ice's music or whatever, it's sometimes I would say there's beginning, intermediate, and advanced level music. Some advanced music is almost like this. It's, it's so soft, but there is an underlying current of music. Now, this is what's cool. Stay with me, because you're going to love this. Check this out. I found something. These are called stems. I want you to listen to this melody of just the rumba on its own. Okay, listen to this. Give me one second. And hopefully it's playing. Give me one moment. I just want to make sure. Okay. Come on, Mrs. Melody. Actually, no, hold on. Let's try the instrumentals. Maybe this will work. Try to find the four and the one as you're listening. Now, 
Now it's interesting when you hear that because that's an overriding sound in the actual music itself. When you're listening to it, like try this one. Oh, this is tricky, right? Listen. If you're very experienced, you will hear the four one and you'll be able to count. This is called the melody. Now notice when the instrumental is played and when the melody is played, that's what you hear when you listen to the rumble more than anything. And if someone's singing, God help you, right? So what we want to do is find an underlying tone or current where we go, oh, that's what I need to hear. Listen to this. Make sense can you hear it play it again if you need to but now I'm gonna put the song back on that was a, this is what the actual song sounds like are you hearing it now there's a melody there's instrumentals and there's You can hear now, when you think of music differently, you're not just listening to everything and hearing a tambourine here and hearing that over there, you hear it all, you start to disseminate what you're trying to understand you're counting to. You, you are counting what the musicians are trying to play to, which is a strict tempo uh, beat, okay? And so the drums in music are responsible for keeping time. So if I put the drums on one more time, and it's gonna pay a lot of, dividends, if you will, for you to listen to the drums, okay? You hear it? Two, three. Right, you get the feeling through the soul. So, I would recommend Hope you heard that, otherwise it's gonna look very strange. Um, but you can hear now through that exercise what you should be aiming to listen to. And all dancers have an underlying uh, drum beat because they're keeping the time for the musicians, okay? And then I would say to you, like, don't worry about the singing of the music, uh, the voice you hear, listen to the underlying beat and drum and that will help you, uh, and that will get you on time and help you master your rumbler. If you've enjoyed today's episode, I have loved bringing it to you. Remember to uh, visit boremastery.com and share this with your friends. 
and tell everyone about it. It's awesome to have you here and I'll see you in the next episode. Thank you for your questions. Thank you Kingsley for tuning in and for everyone else as well.